Yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause. Um, and then, and then if we're right, we'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all this stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid 2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street are saying, no, you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause a going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down sooner than uh, uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. Uh, and you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message, why, why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to uh, 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. People forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp, but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then they took the ceiling off and then things got back to, to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and he and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, and he said this in his last book, just before he died, um, he said, we, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember, Powell's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won, because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger. And then you do have to destroy the economy as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But, but Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So so the question is, so that's the lay of the land. There's the, there's the two competing sides. How does this play out? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise his interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. He um, His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, don't... Um, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed because you have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. As I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. So they, they think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year, there, there are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down, but there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. 
they both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Uh, you know, bare shelves and you couldn't get uh, certain things. It, was, it wasn't that every supermarket shelf was bare the way it was in East Germany in the 1950s, but something was always missing. And that's still the case today. So, of course, prices went up and, uh, you know, people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called um, a cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. Uh, and basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. Um, and so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side. But by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because people can't afford it. Like, you know, maybe if demand is inelastic, if you got to fill up your Ford F-150 truck with gasoline to take the kids to school or go to work. But if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gas because you're not leaving the house. So, so it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if if, if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. If I have to, if I used to pay $75 to fill up my tr truck with gas, and now I have to pay $150, which is about right, I'll do it because I got to get to work, but that's $75 I, I'm not going to spend on something else. I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm not going to go to a show, a concert, or you know, buy a um you know a, a new uh, uh you know a new camera whatever whatever it might be so it it does tend to depress um demand destroy demand and hurt the economy and then it slows down and then the inflation comes down on its own that appears to be happening but pal hasn't really made the distinction he's still he's fighting the last war i hate to use a cliche but he's fighting the volcker war and what he's got looks a little bit more like the herbert hoover war that looks a little bit more like the 1930s than the 1970s so the bottom line on all this is the Fed is going to raise rates at least twice more for the reasons I mentioned. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle is not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there if there is such a thing as the terminal rate. It's another one of these things they made up. Um, uh, inflation is coming down on its own. will probably continue, but for really bad reasons. Uh, if you look at yield curves, look at the Treasury yield curve, Euro dollar futures yield curve, German Bund's yield curve, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, in 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's gonna get the memo, they're gonna cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's gonna get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. See, when these inversions start, sometimes they're a year forward, like, hey, look out, look at the Euro dollar futures yield curve a year from now, man, that thing is inverted. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Okay, the, um, you know, whatever your baseline is, probably treasuries, you know, two year notes or five year notes or whatever, they will come down a lot, not right away. It's, we may still be a month or two away from, on this, but they'll come down a lot 
and then corporate yields will go up a lot because of the recession, because of deterioration, increased bankruptcies, reduced revenues, you know, et cetera. So those spreads will blow out. And it's important to remember, um, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. Uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not moving anything by truck. So there are certain businesses that are concurrent. The yield curves I was talking about are very good forward indicators. They tell you what's going to happen next. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm gonna use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I said, I'm gonna borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits, and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards, they stop doing loans. And then interest rates will start to come down. Interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, you know, even the treasury market. So that's not unusual. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Well, the answer is they have to announce the layoffs. There's all kinds of statute, you know, SEC. So if I'm going to fire 10,000 people, I got to tell the world I'm firing 10,000 people. It doesn't mean I fire them that day. I might fire them you know, on a rolling basis over the next 30 days. And it doesn't mean they walk out the door empty handed and head for the unemployment office. I might give them three months severance, six months severance, et cetera. And so when do they actually show up to the unemployment office and say, you know, give me a check? It might not be till this spring. So the layoff announcements are out there, but the unemployment rate hasn't budged because there is a lag three months. But that's why I said interest rates uh, lag the business cycle and they do. Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. By the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. But we know enough right now to know that number's going up. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. So when the Fed's on a mission, they, they actually don't care about the stock market. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30 percent in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly. That may happen. In fact, I expect it will, but, but we're not there yet. So there may be a pivot, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. So, so the global economy is in bad shape. Uh, it's going into a recession. Now, a lot of people have said that, um, yeah, 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 we're going to have a recession as if it's no big deal. But they're expecting a mild recession. I see a much more severe recession. Now, the other half, what does this mean for financial markets? And there, um, the best way I've been able to explain it, imagine you're in a, an, an Irish pub and you got three Irish storytellers 
and I'm part Irish, so I can talk about the Irish, you know, and, and uh, um, but they're telling three different stories and you got to listen to each one. So there's the Fed story, the market story, and then there's something called reality, what's actually happening. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then uh, there's what I call the reality. Uh, and I guess I'm the storyteller here, but um, what I see is, is a kind of a hybrid the fed's doing what they're doing right or wrong okay they're they're doing what they're doing the market has their own interpretation i agree with the market certainly the bond market that the fed has probably over tightened and they may pivot uh to say that there could be a rate cut maybe i wouldn't rule that out but for a really bad reason in other words if the fed cuts rates which they may the pivot may be real it's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened and they found out too late. And then they got to, then they have to slam on the brakes if, or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it's like 19.9 or something on the Dow, so maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. A couple of things. Number one, I would I would increase my allocation to cash. Um, I'll stick with cash, but let me kind of put that in a context. The most powerful investment tool we have is diversification. Problem is people don't understand what diversification means. So I run into people all the time. They say, well, I'm completely diversified. I own 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors, you know, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, minerals, you know, et cetera. And I say, you're not diversified. You may own 50 stocks in 10 sectors, but you have one asset class, stocks, which are subject to conditional correlation. They, in calm markets, yeah, they, they're idiosyncratic, but in panics, they all go down together or in bubbles, they all go up together. So they're, so you're not diversified. So what is diversification? Diversification is having slices of asset classes that are minimally correlated. There's no, probably not zero, but as close to zero as you can get. So what would that be? You'd have a slice of gold, but I recommend 10%. And people, I have some strong views on gold and I've written a lot about it, but people are surprised to hear me say 10%. Like, oh, Jim, why isn't it 50% or 100% if you believe all this? Well, I do believe it. I wouldn't say it if I didn't, but you don't want to be 100% in anything. You don't want to be 50% in anything. 10% is fine. If I'm wrong, you won't get hurt. And if I'm right, you're going to make so much money that it'll actually kind of be the insurance on the rest of your portfolio. But that leaves 90%. So I would have a large slug in cash, maybe 30%. And people say, well, wait a second. Banks pay me 25 basis points. You know, stock market's going up. Why would I want to be in cash? That's horrible. A couple of things. Number one, the stock market might not always go up. Cash is the opposite of leverage. So leverage increases the volatility of the rest of the portfolio. You'll get much bigger returns, but mm -hmm. you'll have much bigger losses. If you have a slice of cash and you say you've got uh, a volatile asset over here, which are stocks and other volatile assets over here, gold is fairly volatile. If you got that volatility and you have cash, it will reduce the overall volatility so you can sleep better at night. Cash is a great asset in deflation. And if you're talking about inflation, which is here, then you gotta, you gotta deal with that. But uh, don't rule out deflation. If we go into a recession because the Fed over tightens or, you know, the thing about the, the inflation, just a quick side, there, it comes to two flavors. There's cost push and demand pull. Demand pull is when individuals are, are worried about inflation and they start accelerating purchases. Like, hey, I better go buy that washing machine right now because the price is going up or better go buy that house right now because the price is going up. That's demand pull. Cost push, uh, cost push. Uh, push comes from the supply side, not the demand side. And that's what we're seeing uh, mm -hmm. because of what we talked about, supply chain, energy cost. The Fed can't drill for oil. You know, raising interest rates doesn't get you more oil or natural gas. So the Fed can't do anything about it except kill the economy. Yeah, and that'll cool it off. But when you pay, uh, you know, I 
I put gas in my car. I don't just read about this stuff. You know, it used to be $45. Now it's about $75. Multiply that by 200 million cars uh, across America. What happens is it reduces your discretionary income. If you're paying another 30 bucks at the pump twice a week, then you're not going to go out to dinner Friday night. You're not going to, you know, take a, a vacation, whatever it may be. So that depresses all those other areas. So there is this recursive function. So don't rule out deflation down the road. Not right away, but, you know, maybe next year. So cash, but here's the, here's the biggest value of cash. It gives you optionality. People don't understand this. Uh, what if I said to you, hey, I'll sell you, I'll sell you a call option and at the, mar at the market call option on every asset class in the world. You go, Gee, that sounds kind of valuable. You know, well, that's what cash is. You, you know, when things are crashing, you're the one who can go shopping. And nobody's better at this than Warren Buffett. He's got his cash level at Berkshire Hathaway is at an all-time high. So there's a place for that. You can have some stocks, but I would look at the energy sector. I mean, this um, I actually built and I own the largest non-commercial solar module field in New England. And I run my house off it. It's, uh, it produces about 7.5 um, kilowatt hours. Uh, so I know a little bit about it. And uh, what I know is it doesn't work at night. It doesn't work in snow. It doesn't work in rain. It doesn't work in really cloudy days. By the way, you don't run your house off of solar modules. You run your house off of batteries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The modules charge the battery. So you watch the battery level. That's how you manage it. So it works fine. But if you think you can run cities with that, forget it. So it's just not practical uh, at that scale. Even if you thought it was, and it isn't, that's that's very clear. But here comes, uh, you know, wind turbines and uh, solar. I'm not against it. Like you say, I own one, but uh, but they're not scalable. They're intermittent, you can, and they don't give you the base power, uh, the baseline power you need to run a modern power grid. Meanwhile, here's global demand. Okay, so the gap, the gap's getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. Renewables, whatever the pros and cons, are not closing the gap. The gap's getting bigger. There is no substitute for oil and natural gas and uranium. You got to you got to put uranium in the mix and you know, hydro. If you live in Quebec, that's great. A lot of hydro, but it, not so much in the desert. And I've spoken to you know, without mentioning names, I would say you can go no higher in terms of who knows. You know, let's just say board members of the five biggest oil companies in the world who who said yeah as <laughs> he said we talk about that but we, we can't say it publicly because we'll be you know uh dragged you know chained and dragged through the to, through the streets but that's just those are just the facts so therefore if you have an oil sector that's been bashed by the climate alarmists and but you can't do without it which is true buy some oil companies you know when, when they're you know so there's your stock portfolio private equity venture real estate uh not commercial but residential yes and you know farmland that's one of the hottest asset categories and uh and gold so that's diversification and that's the kind of portfolio you want the kind of season to taste so the question is will the fed go down that path do what they have to do do the only thing they can do uh to subdue inflation at the cost of a very severe recession and something like a stock market crash or Will they see that coming? They'll be the last to know. We'll, we'll all see it <laughs> before they do, but uh, they'll, they'll be the last to know. It's because they rely on flood, flood models and they're kind of in their own economic forecasting bubble and they're very defective ways of thinking about the economy and they're very much a creature of inertia. There are a whole lot of reasons why the Fed is not nimble. It's kind of quite the opposite, but they'll see it eventually, probably when it's too late. And will they balk at that point and stop rate hikes and maybe even reduce rates? That could save us from the recession, but that will just amplify the inflation. So mm -hmm. rather than say which one's going to happen, I, I prefer to lay out those two paths and then just watch it very carefully. But more to the point, we've seen this movie before. This is a replay, and I, I think it's on, um, you, know, d you know, like you hit the remote control for double or triple speed. It's going to happen faster, but this is a replay of everything that happened from 2013 to 2019 and, and into 2020, which was, so I'll just go through it quickly. So 2013, May, Bernanke says we're going to taper asset purchases. That's that's money printing, quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it. The market, you know, tanks, bonds go down. Everyone's like, oh, it's over. Bernanke blocked. But finally, in November 2013, they said, okay, the taper begins. They were still printing money, but at a slower rate, and that matters. That went on until late 2014. The taper was over. They stopped buying new assets. They said, okay, here come the interest rate hikes. Except that they didn't come for another year. It wasn't until December 2015 that then Janet Yellen finally raised rates. And then another year for the second rate increase, so it was December 2016. So it was really, really slow. It took two and a half years. But they got to 
two rate hikes. But then here comes Jay Powell, and then like clockwork, boom, 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 25 basis point hikes every meeting. And all the Fed was trying to do was was to get back to normal. They were trying to get interest rates to maybe two and a quarter, two and a half, get the balance sheet down to, you know, something like 2.5 trillion. They never specified it, but that would have been a reasonable level. So, okay, now interest rates are kind of normal, two and a half, balance sheets down around two and a half trillion. We're back to normal. We finally got through the, the global financial crisis of 2008. We kind of, we undid all that stuff. Well, what happened? Um, from October 1st, 2018 to December 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 20%. That was the, the, the December 24th, 2018, we call it the, the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock market went down 3% in one day. But the Fed uh, was tightening into the weakness, as they always do. And the last interest rate hike, it was uh, December 16th or 17th, they, within a day or two, but mid-December 2018, they were still hiking and raising rates. And that was the last straw. And then the market just tanked. And then finally, Jay Powell got that message uh, first week of January 2019. He says, okay, we're, that's it. We're going to be patient. Use the word patient. It's one of these code words. You have to get the code book out and see what it means. But patient means we won't raise rates again without giving you advance warning so you can get out of your carry trades or whatever. Uh, and then he went further, said, huh, looks like we got to cut rates. And they did. And then by early 2020, here comes the pandemic. And then they took rates all the way back to zero. And then they started QE, I don't know, six, seven, call what you want. They took the balance sheet to seven and a half trillion dollars after getting it down to three and a half trillion. So look at that whole sequence from 2013 to early 2020, including the pandemic. What happened? They tapered the asset purchases. They raised rates. They sank the stock market. Then they said, okay, no more rate hikes. Then they cut rates and then they started QE. And by by April 2020, where were we? Zero rates, back down to zero. And the balance sheet was a seven and a half trillion after getting down to about uh, three, three and a half trillion. So that was a big um, a circle. They ended up back where they started from. But the point being, they failed to normalize. They failed to get rates where they wanted. They failed to get the balance sheet where they wanted. They did sink the stock market. Okay, now two years forward, here we are again. What are we doing? They just raised rates at the at the March meeting. They're going to raise them again in May. And that's the easiest forecast I've ever made. 50 basis points, May 4th. Boom. You can, you know, you can count on it. And they're going to announce, uh, by the way, I don't have a crystal ball. The Fed told us this. I mean, that's the thing about the Fed. They may be wrong, but they're transparently wrong. So they tell you what mistakes they're going to make in advance. So that's the Fed forecasting is actually fairly straightforward because you just have to believe them. Uh, so uh, so they're going to raise rates again in May, probably 50 basis points. They're going to announce a reduction in the balance sheet, whether they actually start it in May. They probably will. $100 billion a month reduction in asset purchases. So that's QT, quantitative tightening. In other words, they're running the same playbook they tried to run or they started to run in 2013, 2014. They failed the last time why do they think they're going to be any more successful this time? Why do they think they can get out of this? And the answer is, <coughs> pardon me, the answer is they cannot without a recession. They can normalize rates in the balance sheet and they can stop inflation, but not without causing recession and not without causing a stock market crash. So the big question for the next year is, will the Fed do that? And they may. Or will they balk again, at which point you might rescue the market, but the inflation is just going to go wild that's that's the debate but 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 the thing is about framing it that way you've got two paths and we'll get, we'll get signals along the way we won't we won't be the last to know the fed will but we won't you'll be able to see this coming china doesn't have any of that none of it there's no significant chinese bond market they don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers i described they don't have the physical infrastructure and most of all they don't have a rule of law you can't trust the chinese as far as you can throw them I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a, place, a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. 
and uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously, this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the, you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no. No, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, about 100 people in the room, you know, three-star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box. We live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so, so what were the what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, last week, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold, and their, the value of their gold is more than the value of the U.S. treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is, that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said... Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What do you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed $4 trillion in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but the Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up. Seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, etc. And it's all empty. I mean, this is all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. So, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. And they will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, and of course they wasted it, and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might've looked nice the day they built it, but 
it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's going to happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% slice down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. The treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You pro fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currencies. We can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States, the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed $4 trillion. Congress, we had trillion dollars.